The following is an exclusive presentation of WI Garden Media, the voice of Garden Talk Radio. Coming up on the program today, we're going to go over about you don't need to rush to get those plants in the ground quite yet as well as compost for your garden. There's some options. Our guest is houseplant guru Lisa Elder Steinoff, and we'll answer your garden questions. The hour is full, so join us. You are listening to the most informationally packed hour of garden-focused radio in the country and on the internet with your host, husband and wife team Joey and Holly Baird. This is the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. And welcome to the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. Happy you've taken time out of your day to tune into the program, whether you're listening live on one of the 20 AM and FM frequencies broadcasting our program here in 2023 through our parent website under the Season 7 tab. But 7 tab, that website is the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com through a podcast replay, in-studio video replay, however you're doing such. Thank you very much for doing it. I'm your host, Joy Baird. Beside me is my wife, co-host, best friend, and gardening partner. Hi, Baird. This program is for you, about you, to help your garden grow better, to maintain your landscape, grow healthier trees, make your grass look greener, as well as preserving what you grow. If you want to be part of the program and participation is appreciated, outside, in addition to listening, you can send us an email to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. That's gardentalkradio at gmail.com. Or you can give us a call at 1-800-927-SHOW, toll-free, coast-to-coast, 1-800-927-7469. Well, Holly, spring in some portions of the country has sprung, as it's said. Others is still waiting to sprung. To spring, I guess it would be. And um, some people are just kind of in between. Now, there's times where we have gotten spring-like conditions for 72, 96 hours, and then bad things happen again. I, <laughs> Yeah, even as of late, it seems like, around here. So you want to keep in mind that you might think, oh, it's 50 degrees today, and I just have that spring fever itch and i want to plant some stuff well scratch it but don't plant anything (laughs) exactly maybe just drive around with your windows down i don't know go to the garden center go to the garden center don't buy anything well you could buy something like some seeds or something well you could buy well yeah you can go you can get some seeds from jung's uh seeds.com um and and there's certain things you don't want to buy from your garden center we talked about that last last week on the program right but But, so but you might get this itch where you're like i can't wait to put these peas in the ground and these radishes and all the things and plant all the things and then the next day it snows well i i I, there there's a saying and i think i'm abbreviating it somewhat it says a wise man plants his garden the first time when his neighbor plants his the second time right so you don't you don't want to be the second planting neighbor. Yeah, yeah. You want you to avoid that. Yeah. You want to be the first or the wait wait guy. So first of all, long range forecast is what we need to look at. Second is air temperature, but more importantly, soil temperature. What does the soil temperature tell us, Holly? That what what do we need to look for? What does that mean? It just basically means that the soil temperature would be able to sustain the growth and continued growth of whatever you put in the soil. So if you know that the soil temperature should be 40 degrees, that means that it should hopefully stay consistent consistently. And obviously there might be occasional exceptions, but when you look at the long range forecast and it shows nothing but sunny warmer increasing days for the next 10 days you're probably in a good spot now for many of us we are just waiting for that forecast those days to get to what is considered safe for the early crops the cool weather crops the brassicas the radishes the the greens there are uh, the, and then you get to the next level of gardeners who have low tunnels or or uh, hoops uh, growing hoops or uh, frost covers uh, frost sheets where they put over and they can what is considered or categorized as season extenders and that is an investment in which you can get a little bit more out of the beginning of the season and in the end of the season or winter and spring with these domes in which you can either construct with pvc pipes some six mil plastic and some um uh, metal rods um i forget what we call it. 
Somebody's yelling at it right now on the radio. Um, dowels? No, yeah, they're like dowels, but they're metal. That they rebar. Oh. That's what it is. And you can make your own. Uh, there is a finesse to them as meaning it is a small greenhouse. If it is mildly warm outside, it's going to be really warm inside, and you could potentially bake your greens before you harvest them in your low tunnel. Right. Those those low tunnels, um, small greenhouses, uh, miniature greenhouses, whatever you want to call them, they heat up fast and quick. And then, like Joy said, you could be baking your greens, which is the opposite of what you want for sure. So, yeah, so you want to keep in mind that... How do we can, find the soil temperature, Holly? You can take your meat thermometer... From Walton's. From Walton's. Um, and you can dig down, I don't know, like a few few inches. Right. Uh, wherever the root zone you think would be. And you just put that, stick that thing in there and let it tell the temperature. And then, then you know. There you go. Digital thermometer. Meat thermometer works well. Walton's Incorporated has that. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Uh, but it works very well to get that instant reading. And just because that reading is a certain temperature in one part of the garden, that doesn't mean that is going to be a across-the-garden measurement based on what you've got, how your garden lays out, how the sun hits it. You might have many microclimates inside of your garden, and which means that potentially, if you follow and and you know the long range forecast, the air temperature, the soil temperature, you can plant certain things in certain areas of your garden where you can't plant other things at, because of that microclimate or the way the sun is hitting that soil in the back corner or the front, the high end or the, wherever it is. Right. Yeah. And that's that's what you want to to keep in mind. Now, when you look at the long term forecast, would you say that you want to think about an average or maybe you just want to see that it's it's just steadily staying where you want it to stay? If you're low, if you need 40 degrees at minimum temperature, let's just go with soil temperature. Anything if you're if your low temperatures are 40 or above, you're going to see you're going to you need that low temperature to be at the minimum what you need for the soil temperature to be. Because if the soil temperature needs to be 40 and you're at 45 minimum for the next 15 days, you're probably going to be OK. I think another thing to keep in mind is is rain. So if you are in an area that gets a lot of rain, especially like us in April. Yeah. If you decide to plant these seeds and you see in the long-term forecast you're going to have four straight days of rain, you might want to back off a right. week. Yeah. Uh, wait for that rain to clear because most of these seeds in which you're planting are smaller seeds which can be disrupted by water. And then if you think you have planted a nice row of spinach, it's all to the back end of the garden because it's flushed down because of four inches of rain. So you want to be uh, mindful of that. So... Uh, whenever we're planting the, and this is cool weather crops, but let's talk about warm weather crops, your tomatoes, your eggplants, your peppers, your cucumbers, cucumbers, as much as you try to put them in early cucumbers, don't like cool soil. They don't even like warm, uh, okay, warm soil. They need very warm. soil. they need like 60 plus degrees in order to do what they need to do. Uh, tomatoes are fidgety. You know, you can get around 50 is what they're saying. Wait, you know, we we typically hear where we're at in southeast Wisconsin, Memorial Day weekend is the traditional start of summer where you can plant your tomatoes. Now, in years past, we've planted them the 10th of May because that long-range forecast has shown much above normal. And we've also waited to the first weekend in June to plant because we've had such a cold, wet May. So this is the same for your, your warm weather plants, especially your watermelon, your pumpkins, your squashes that need that hot temperature. If they need hot temperatures, they need very warm soil in order to grow and to grow correctly. Right. And that's that's the biggest thing is that I know that a lot of people, especially here, we're located in Wisconsin and southeast Wisconsin. They're right on Memorial Day weekend. They're like, we have to get all these plants in the ground. This is what we're going to do. And Joy, as Joy had mentioned, sometimes it's okay to wait that week. And then sometimes it's okay to start a week early. And we know there is a certain caliber of gardener that it doesn't matter what the temperature is. They're going to slam them in the ground because they want to be that first person on the block or at their church or at their social gathering to say, I've got my first tomato and it's weeks before anybody else. Well, now you can find um, you can find the first tomato just by 
buying the right seeds. So yeah. that might be an option for you too. Um, but yeah, there are people like that that want to to be the first. And that's, you know, if that's your jam, that's okay. I, I commend you. But for us, I know we we would rather plant the first time and the right time. And seeds are expensive. Plant starts are even more expensive every year. So if you're relying on plant starts because you do not want to start seeds or you're unable to start seeds, uh, you want to make your move and you want to make it count. If you're planting seeds and some of them don't come up, that's a little less of a hit financially than if you've got six or seven tomato plants at five plus dollars a pop and three of them don't make it. If you started like we do, we start typically about 120 to 150 tomatoes and then wean them down to about 80. We've got backups to backups so we can cover ourselves that we don't have to go purchase tomatoes or peppers at the garden center. Right. And again, it just comes down to being to being smart and to being I don't want to say cautious, but just making an informed decision for yourself. Your mileage may vary yes. where you're at. Well, Holly, we talked about the meat thermometer from Walton's for your soil temperature, but Walton's has a lot of other things besides a meat thermometer that is intended for meat, but you can use for soil temperature. Absolutely. So we are brought to you today by our sponsor, Walton's Inc. We know you care about where your food comes from. You want to can and preserve your fruits and vegetables. But what about the meat? At waltonsinc.com, you can get all the equipment, seasoning, and supplies to make sausage, jerky, and any other meat products your way to your high standards. If you want to make snack sticks that people will actually like, Walton's created meatjustics.com, an informational site to help you make the best finished product. Walton's even has their full line of meat grinders, mixers, and sausage stuffers to help you go from animal to edible. You can go to waltonsinc.com, use the code GROW50 GROW50 to save 10% off of orders of $50 or more. Hang out with us when we return. We're going to discuss the wonderful world of compost for your garden. You're tuned in to the Garden with Joey and Holly radio show. Got a question for Joey and Holly? Send it via email anytime to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. Grip6 produces American-made products with sleek designs and quality materials. Based and manufactured in Utah, they have high-quality and durable products that last a lifetime. They're built beyond tough. Their wool socks come from Rocky Mountain source materials, are soft and comfortable, keep your feet warm and dry, and come with a lifetime guarantee. Even for the most sensitive toes, these socks are made for everyone. High-quality wool socks make a huge difference for happy feet. They fit in with all the many things you do from around the house to the outdoors and beyond. They are comfortable and long-lasting. These socks are great for gardening because they keep your feet so comfortable no matter the conditions outside. It's hard to overstate how amazing these feel to have warm, dry feet as you work in your garden. Designed and manufactured in-house for the best results and quality every time. When you purchase from Grip6, you're supporting long life cycle products and American-made manufacturing. Check out their belts, wallets, and socks at grip6.com. Use coupon code RADIO15 to save 15% off your order at grip6.com. Wind River Chimes creates a symphony in any space. Chimes that are inspired by nature and designed to make the natural world even more inspiring. Music speaks to everyone. Individually handcrafted in Virginia for over 35 years and hand-tuned for an exceptional precision and lasting beauty. Because in life, the winds of change are always moving. But no matter where they carry you, Wind River Chimes will always be the inspiring harmony. With a large selection and customization options, you will find the sound that soothes you. Visit windriverchimes.com to shop and find out more. Rootmaker starts your plants off right and keeps them going through harvest. From their seed starting trays with an innovative design that air prunes the roots to their large variety of grow bags, 1 to 60 gallons. Their products will provide you the harvest you've never seen before. Visit rootmaker.com and use coupon code RADIO23 to save 15% off your order at rootmaker.com. Com. Dig planting holes from a comfortable standing position. Step, twist, pull, and plant. Visit ProPlugger.com. Pomona's Universal Pectin is a high-quality pectin that gels reliably with low amounts of any sweetener. If you're trying to reduce the amount of sugar in your diet, you'll love Pomona's Universal Pectin. Now you can make healthy homemade jams and jellies sweetened to your taste. You can use sugar or honey to sweeten. Pomona's Universal Pectin keeps indefinitely when stored in an airtight container. Easy to use, versatile, and comes with directions and recipes in every box. Find out more and where to buy at PomonaPectin.com. Also available at natural food stores and online. Ah, spring, the season of renewal, an unexpected house guest. None the worse, perhaps, than ants. And I'm not talking about great Aunt Mabel. When you need to get rid of ants fast, you need rescue ant baits. 
Rescue ant baits are pre-baited, child-resistant, and ready to use right out of the box. No sticky liquid, no mess. Made in the USA by the makers of the popular Rescue Fly and Yellow Jacket Traps. Learn more at rescue.com. That's R-E-S-C-U-E dot C-O-M. Are you bugged by bugs? You need naturally green products, no more bugs, environmentally friendly, made in the USA. No More Bugs is a cedar blend that repels and eliminates mosquitoes, ticks, fleas, roaches, ants, and more. No More Bugs is safe for you, your pets, and plants. Visit nomorebugs.net for free shipping on orders over $50. Use code free ship for me. The Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show is brought to you by the following. Dripworks, Rise Gardens, Grip6, Bloomin' Easy, Fleet Farm, Waltons Incorporated, Blue Ribbon Organics, Tree Diaper. Find all sponsors at the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener.com and thank them for their support. Welcome back to the Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show. We're going to talk about compost, but first, a word from our friends at Farmers Defense. Farm and garden in the ultimate comfort. Farmers Defense has a lightweight and durable sleeves made to protect you against the elements while farming. Farmer's sleeves offer unparalleled protection of arms and skin for any farmer, gardener, or outdoor worker. Say goodbye to irritated skin and sunburns in the garden. Their sleeves offer cooling comfort and protection against the elements outdoors. An alternative to thick clothing, Farmer's Defense is made of a wicking material with UBF protection, factor 50 plus to protect you from allergens and scratches. To find all their great products and more, visit FarmersDefense.com. Well, compost, Holly, we can't never make enough of it, so there's options on when you or where you should or can purchase it from. So compost is the lifeblood of a garden. It is a great additive uh, that you can add to soil that may not be as good as you would like it to be. You can grow in 100% compost. We have done that for a number of years, and, and it's worked quite well. So compost in the garden. Where do we get it? So you want to first you can you can buy it and so you can contact a local garden center, a local um, sometimes there's places that just only sell things like uh, topsoil, fill, compost, gravel, etc. I don't know what you call those places, but there are those locations. Uh, I guess that would be like a landscape supply probably. Right. Yeah. Um, I know there's one not too far from us that they sell basically just like landscape supply companies. Well, if you're in the Milwaukee area, Blue Ribbon Organics right. for compost. Right. Um, so that's, you can also, a lot of times if you know of a company like Blue Ribbon Organics, you can do a store locator as well. Um, so that's one option is to buy it. Now, not all compost that is free is good. Right. So we were going to talk about free compost. Right. Right. And so a lot of times people in their municipalities, here's an option. You can come fill up your car or whatever, get this free compost. I guess maybe you would fill up a truck. You probably wouldn't put compost directly in the trunk of your car. People, we, I've done it. You put, right. a, you put a tarp down. Right. I'm not, saying, I'm not saying that you, we wouldn't. It, it can be would. done. I'm just saying that some people might not want to do that. Maybe um, uncomfortable for them. Right. Yeah. They, they might have different needs Con, a, trunk. a trunk full of compost in the cadillac may not be what some people may but be back happy. up that 99 honda uh -huh. <laughs> so anyway um yeah so that's one thing is is that it's like free might come as a at a cost you don't necessarily know where that compost is coming from if it's something where they just collected everybody's yard scraps and made the compost that's a little dicey. And if they're collecting yard scraps, people have the tendency to throw anything in that pile because it disappears. Right. And that's the thing is if you think about it, like if you had sometimes if you had a huge way to get rid of stuff, especially your yard waste, you're like, it's going to the city. Let me just put this in here. Who cares? And something they don't care, but it's more or less like Joey said, they're getting rid of it. So the reason why that can be bad is... People spray chemicals on all sorts of plant life, predominantly weed and feed on grass. Weed and feed contains a chemical that is designed to kill any broadleaf plant. Lamb's quarter, dandelions, fill in the blank. So that it absorbs into the leaf of the, of the plant. You cut the grass, you bag the grass, you put the grass for the municipality to pick up. That 
persistent, it is so persistent, it's still in the grass, in the breakdown process, in the compostable process, and this happens if you do it or the city does it, that that still is active, such an active ingredient that when you apply it to your garden, it will and it can very much damage or disform your broadleaf plants, your peppers, your eggplants, your potatoes, your green beans, because that 2,4-D, that, bro- that broadleaf uh, chemical that's in weed and feed is still active and it can take many years to ratify this the problem absolutely and that's something that you want to keep in mind with that free compost is it could e- contain the 2,4-D even with horse manure the broadleaf spray called killer compost you can search that term that is a, that is a big concern now that it will damage or disform your broadleaf plants It's definitely not something that you want to quote unquote mess with, especially when you are growing, you're growing vegetables and you spend all that time, um, whether it be starting seeds or just planting the seeds. And then all of a sudden your vegetables are are not looking so good. So there's a couple of ways in order to figure this out. One, if you're getting manure from a farm and you're going to age that to compost, you can ask the farmer, hey, what what are the animals eating and have you sprayed anything on the the feed as a grass and then bailed it up for the feed if you're getting it from a municipality that is not a very simple question to ask because one part of the pile may be good and the center may be bad and the far left portion might be a mixture of both and there's no way to tell it's not like the city yard guy is like, oh, this came from the house right. that sprays the lawn. They're not going to know that. The only way you're going to know is if you take a small sample and try to plant some beans because they are rapidly, they're rapid growers. And in five to seven days, you can see them sprout. And if there's any disformity because it's picking up that chemical in the compost, then you know it's bad soil. But then you got to figure out the problem is, did they mix that pile again because more people dug out of it and they just piled it all together with a front loader and mixed it all again so keep that in mind if you are attempting to do such because i mean it's it's free so you could just take what you need do the test grow and then i guess dump it i guess if you don't want it you could put it back in the street for them to take it back (laughs) we we've had people at garden talk say hey i've gotten city municipality compost and here's what's happening and it's been that they we've also had people who have composted their own lawn clippings and had you know lots and lots of cubic feet of compost and they've been spraying weed and feed on their grass and then they've put that toxified compost in the garden and the remitigation of the process in order to get that out of the soil is a multi-year deal with a natural natural process and it's not you know it's not your fault because you might have grown up where you're parent or whoever sprays their lawn with weed and feed and then oh this is what my grandpa used and then you go to the garden center and you you see that you know and it looks familiar in your head and you're like oh it's fine my my why would my family poison me and it's not that they're poisoning you but you are poisoning your possible compost anytime you purchase compost from a reputable landscape place or garden center Anybody that I have talked to, they have a tracking mechanism in which they know where it came from and the sources in which it was made from. So if there is an issue, they can track back that particular batch to know what's going on. Now, let's talk about let's just adding let's just add kitchen scraps to our garden. Can we do that? Do we have to worry about animals? What happens? I I would say kitchen scraps as long as it's not anything that involves dairy meat bones um any sort of bones like that and then dairy yeah dairy Dairy, cheese now you could add that that can be added to a compost pile assuming the 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 caveat is if you've got a pile that's way far away in a back corner of a field somewhere that you're just dumping everything and just letting nature the raccoons and the possums dig through it and break it down over a course of a couple of years if you're in a residential area, you want to avoid those because those are attracted, by, uh, those are attractee items. And um, even if you just bury them in the garden, meaning you dig a one foot deep trench, pour them in, and then cover them up, they're going to dig that out. So your scrap vegetables, your those type of your potato peels, shredded paper, those can be dumped in a trench in the garden. And you want to mark that because you want to 
not necessarily plant, let's say, tomatoes over that patch this year, but by next year it'll be broke down to where it will feed the the plants uh, in that area. Right, and that's um, that's that's a good tip. And there's there's options like that to to put things. There's also products that you can purchase to speed up the compost process. Right, certain compost bins, uh, tumblers, that type of thing. And there's a, a multitude of resources online that will indicate things that you didn't know could ever go in a compost pile uh, and that you are probably throwing out. And if you are concerned about landfills and filling them up with unnecessary uh, compostable items, those can be not given to the city for trash pickup, but put in your compost pile for uh, recycling or re- remitigating of the soil in your garden. Another thing that you want to keep in mind is that when you are composting yourself, um, that there are different methods. There's yes. tumblers, there's um, hot composting, there's cold or passive composting. So some, some of them might work better for you. And then depending where you live, there might be some sort of municipal or HOA mm-hmm or whatever sort of uh, rule, guideline, where sometimes it has to be contained. You can do it, but here's how you have to do it. Sometimes it has to be X, Y, Z, feet away from your neighbors or your house or whatever. So it's good to keep that in mind, especially sometimes with those HOAs. They can be a little funny. They they can just be problems. Problems, yes. They can be problems. Yes. There are people that live in HOAs right now that are going, yes, they're problems. Well, Holly, spring, will it's going to be start warming up sooner or later. We know spring is getting closer, and we all will want to enjoy the yard without sharing it with those beetles and grubs. Yeah, with spring just around the corner, it's time to start thinking about controlling beetles and grubs in your yard or your garden or wherever. Grub Gone can be applied to your turf or garden or around ornamentals to control those grubs and lessen the impact that those beetles have on your yard. This summer, easy to use, apply with a commercial spreader or irrigate right into the soil, biologically, specifically to target those beetle invaders without harming those beneficial insects such as bees, butterflies, and ladybugs. And it's only been the only non-chemical that works. You can find out more at phylumbioproducts.com. That's P-H-Y-L-L-O-M bioproducts.com, phylum bioproducts.com hang out with us when we come back house plant guru lisa elder scott uh, steinhoff will be with us you're tuned in to the garden with join holly radio show got a question for joey and holly send it via email anytime to garden talk radio at gmail.com Jung Seed Company is a family-owned and operated gardening company since 1907 with the largest selection of seeds and plants online. Use coupon code 10TG23 to receive 10% off your order at jungseeds.com. Again, that coupon code is 10TG23. Make watering easy. DripWorks provides quality drip irrigation supplies and equipment to gardeners just like you for all your growing needs across the U.S. and Canada. Purchase online at dripworks.com. Mantis Tillers, the premium long-lasting gas-powered tillers, are the perfect solution for any garden. This Mantis machine is available with two or four cycle engines with a 19-inch or 16-inch tilling width. Your DIY companion in your garden and your lawn converts easily for edging, aerating, and more with optional attachments. Find details at mantis.com. Garden like a pro in three easy steps and receive customized fertilizer recommendations for your garden or lawn. Soil Savvy helps you determine what nutrients your plants need to thrive. Never again overapply nutrients they don't need. A patented process that makes you a smart gardener. To get your soil test kit, go to mysoilsavvy.com. Aqua-mart.com has everything you need for eye-pleasing outdoor water features on your property. For over 25 years, we've been creating and field testing beautiful water features in order to provide you with the most reliable products and best value in the industry. From easy to install pond and water fill kits to pumps, fish food, and more, you'll find everything you need to install and maintain a naturally balanced water feature in your yard. Make your backyard a true oasis and maintain it well. Visit aqua-mart.com to shop for all your needs. We know that you appreciate the value of a beautifully landscaped yard, but tackling such a project yourself can seem way too complicated, right? Bloomin' Easy Plants are the answer. 
Their plants are low maintenance and offer exceptional beauty and color for your yard. Plus, they offer free seasonal care reminders with simple how-to videos tailored to the plants that you choose. With Bloomin' Easy on your side, creating the yard that you've always wanted becomes as easy as plant, water, and relax. Check them out at your local garden center or by visiting bloominteasyplants.com. Worried about watering too much or too little? Tree diaper technology is the best way to stabilize your soil moisture in your garden, trees, or house plants. Use coupon code GARDEN15 to save 15% off at treediaper.com. The Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show is brought to you by the following. Chapin Manufacturing Incorporated, Aqua-Mart, Soil Savvy, Wind River Chimes, Wisconsin Greenhouse Company, Pro Plugger, Deer Defeat, Dripping Springs Oyas, Phylum Bioproducts. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Welcome back to the Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show. Thank you for being part of the program today. Lisa Eldhart Skynhoff will be with us moments away. But first, Rise Garden with the technology to help you grow indoors all year long. Rise Gardens is a revolutionary hydroponic gardening system for your home. Instead of food traveling hundreds or even over a thousand miles before it hits your plate, harvest veggies, herbs, and greens you need for dinner tonight in the comfort of your own home. No green thumb required. Gardening made easy with Rise Gardens app, a step-by-step guidance from seed to harvest, a complete garden on a shelf and comes with everything you need to grow healthy with the freshest food for you and your loved ones. Fully customize your garden to your needs and preferences. Find out more information to get your Rise Garden, visit risegardens.com. Well, Holly, let's go to the hotline and bring in our guest for this week. Lisa Eldred Seinkoff, she is the houseplant guru, is an author, blogger, freelance writer, and houseplant enthusiast. She loves taking care of her own plants and teaching others to take care of theirs. Welcome to the program, Lisa. Thank you. It's so nice to be here. Well, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule, not only to educate Holly and myself, but all of our listeners. Thank you. And I'll start with this one. We often think about fertilizing our soil outside, pruning, caring for our plants outdoors how can we apply all of that outdoor uh, how can we apply that outdoor for indoor plants do do we need to fertilize them maintain them kind of in the same manner um i you know we i think so we i definitely think you need to fertilize them i'm i tell people i am not the most consistent person when it comes to fertilizing as i should be but you know ever i tell them don't i never use full strength fertilizer but i do you can either use a quarter strength of whatever fertilizer you're using uh, every time you water so that it's consistent because I forget or almost full strength every fourth watering. So that's why people say about once a month to now, fertilize. Now, and I only fertilize when it, they're actively growing. Okay. So do you recommend a liquid fertilizer, whether that is a commercial or homemade version rather than a granule? Um, I use the, I use the kind, you know, that makes the, the water blue, Okay. <laughs> but you know, I say anything, anything you use that, you know, is labeled for houseplants is fine. And, and as far as like pruning and, um, you know, caring for your plants indoors, I, I think that pruning is a, I went to a friend's house the other day and her, her, uh, she's like, we have the same kind of crown of thorn and it, they're, it's thornless, but hers is like really bushy and beautiful and full. And mine is just like one long extensive you know branch and it's like i should have pruned it so that it stays bushy and and looks more aesthetically pleasing than this big long one thing you know coming out instead of being a nice pruned shrub like a shrub you know what i mean right because pruning will shape pruning will stimulate additional growth is what you're saying of course yes exactly yeah so if something's getting out of control or it's not even or you don't like it it's okay to trim it and then you can you know if it's you can start a new plant. What What is the guidelines for trimming? Quarter, half the size? What, what yeah, we... I wouldn't, unless I was root pruning it, you right, know, right. I wouldn't do more than a quarter. Yeah, I wouldn't do more than a quarter. Okay. So, yeah, because, you know, it needs enough, needs, you know, we don't want to, yes. <laughs> I wouldn't, I wouldn't do more than that. Just like I a hair, probably just, just a haircut. Yeah, just like a haircut. Yeah. You can always take a little bit off, but if you take too much off, eh, that's an oops, you can't undo. Right. And it's, and it's really better to keep, you know, it's better to trim it a little, you know, from the beginning to try to keep that shape instead of getting it out of completely out of shape and then trying to cut the heck out of it and then, you know, try to get it back into shape. And then it just looks like you've butchered your plants. Right. Yeah. 
it takes a little longer to recover. Fantastic. So your most recent book, Bloom, The Secrets the Secrets of Growing Flowering Houseplants, you're round. Um, tell us a tip or something unique that will encourage our listeners to pick up a copy. Well, I think that, I, you know, this book, I, I love it because there, there really wasn't anything out there about flowering houseplants. And I think they're often overlooked because people think they're hard to grow. And they're really not. It's just a lot of times they need maybe a little more light than a foliage houseplant. And not always. It just depends on the plant. But I tell people um, when I do my talk that goes along with the book, there's, I think that you can have a houseplant in bloom every day of the year in your home. And I tell, I, you know, I talk to them about, and not in the book, but um, there's four houseplants I think that you, if you have in your house, it will, you will then have something in bloom every day of the year, but just with those four houseplants. But when you look through the book, you know, you're going to find out that some of them bloom, like a Phalaenopsis orchid can bloom for a year anyway, at least many months if you take good care of it. I'll be. And then uh, one, whenever you say blooming houseplant, I think of orchids. Am I, is, is that in the same realm? Well, yeah, like the Phalaenopsis orchid is yeah. that moth orchid. Yeah, right. but I, there's, I talk about other orchids in there. Um, there's, you know, other orchids that are easy to grow. Jewel orchids are really easy, and they're terrestrial compared to epiphytic orchids. You know, you grow them in a soil kind of like a normal, when I say normal houseplant, I don't know if that's probably not the <laughs> best word, but like a regular houseplant. Instead of, you know, growing it on in bark or on a, on a piece of, you know, like on a piece of cork or something mounted, you know, you just grow them in in potting mix Be, because so, you know orchids african violets i think are having a big comeback mm -hmm. which i'm so happy about because people may not be aware that orchid one or the, there's multiple orchids one orchid is oh, not just course. the fix of all orchids you just don't buy an orchid oh, oh this no is no it. no no oh my gosh if you just uh, right now at this time of year and i'm sure in every state whatever state or wherever you live this is the time of year um that when all the orchid shows are going on because this is kind of when a lot of them are blooming, you know, early, this is kind of early spring, late winter. Right. And you can go to those orchid shows and see, you know, there's dendrobiums and cattleyas and phalaenopsis and um, I can't, there's so many, pathiopetalum. So there's so many, many to choose from. And some of them are just are a little more specialized. I think people are afraid of orchids because a lot of them do need some kind of more specialized care. And, um, but there's lots of them that, that don't so right. you know well, i think everybody should have some a couple orchids in their house <laughs> well let's talk about let's transition over to succulents it's it's a very popular plant and i'm sure you get this question for new gro growers for these fun little plants what are some tips to help maintain the plants to get the best life out of them you know succulents and and cacti too especially i live in michigan so in that you know this midwestern northern area it's really hard to keep them looking the shape that they should be in the winter they get really etiolated you know they lean for the light they right. they they grow you know crazy long and reach for the light so um you really really have to i'm in the cactus and succulent society and a lot of them they put them outside in the winter, summer first of all but when they bring them in they put them under lights but they put them in a cool place and really don't water them because they don't want that growth to be, un, I want to say unnormal, but not the correct growth for that plant. You know how, like I say, like they stretch or they, they want them to look like they would naturally. Right. So it's really all about light. You need, if you don't have the right light in your home, south, um, west window, um, then you need to grow them under lights, under some kind of electric lights to keep them really looking their best. Fantastic. So we are talking with Lisa Eldred Steinkoff, the houseplant guru. So terrariums, ter terrariums, and obviously a lot of different houseplants, but terrariums are making a comeback. I know there's a lot of different uh, little figurines and there's all sorts of stuff on social media about uh, for the terrariums. What are they and what are some good plants to put in them and what are some mistakes people might make with them? Okay, I love terrariums, and um, I think the biggest mistake that's made, at least with I've done this before, is once you make one, you know they're sealed. That's what a terrarium is. Otherwise, it's, if it's open, it's a dish garden, right? So if you seal it you, for the first oh, quite a long time, I mean, like I would say 
weeks to months, you have to keep watch of that. And, and if it gets too, you know, too much condensation, you need to open the, the lid and let it kind of air out because there has to be a happy medium, just enough condensation to keep the plants watered, but not enough to, you know, they just turn to mush and rot. So I think that's the mistake people make is putting plants in them and then just sealing them up and saying, okay, I'm done and it's going to live. There's a little bit of work and they need to be pruned and you got to keep like dead leaves out and all that kind of thing so that they don't, you know, mold and just kind of disintegrate. And um, the, I think the next big, the biggest mistake is that people put succulents in them and cacti. Number one, they're, they don't have enough light. And if they did have enough light in a jar for a succulent cacti, you would probably, they would bake because they would be, have to be in so much sun. So you need lower light plants like ferns. And I have, I have apicias in mine. I have ferns. Um, I have like three different kinds of ferns in one. And apicia is like a gesneriad that needs a little more humidity. So it's kind of like humidity, moisture loving plants and not succulents and cactus, which a lot of people put in them. Well, I would guess that indoor house plants are some people treat, oh, you know, like outdoor plants. They give them too much love. They kill them with love. <laughs> kill them with kindness. Yes. yes. And I, you know, I, I was, I'm doing the talk I do is you can actually sunburn a plant inside if you move it from a low light window into a high light window. They can, you can, you know, sunburn your plants. You can, and when they, people say overwatering, I just call it watering too much. You know, you're just. You're not giving your plant time to dry out a little bit. You know, they, you know most plants don't want to sit in water at, at all. And then, and then, you know, you keep watering them. you got to quit loving them so much. <laughs> L- let nature <laughs> do its thing. Yes, just let them, you know, let them grow. Watch them. Check them. And, you know, a lot of people, I water them on a schedule. You never water. I don't water on a schedule. I, when they look dry or they're dry, mm-hmm. I water them. Or, you know, they're starting to get dry. I just don't. You know, every Monday is not my watering day or anything. It's well, when they need it. Well, and, and your finger is a magnific- ni- magnificent tool to stick it in the soil to figure out if it needs water. That's right. That's right. And, you know, you can check on a schedule, but you don't necessarily need to water on a schedule because they may have been a week, especially this year in Michigan, we haven't had any sun. I mean, I, I can't even, I can probably count on two hands how much, how many sunny days we've had in January, you know, since January. And if there's not a lot of sun, your plants aren't photosynthesizing as much. So they're not using as much water. So you may, you know, have to water them only every other week or something, you know, just depends. Then you would, you know, less often than you normally would. And, and how dry your house is. That has probably a key that, factor, too. Yes. Yeah. Right. The heater. Yeah, the heater is not, yeah, it's not helpful either. I mean, it can dry them out pretty fast. And, the hum, you know, the less humid it is, the more moisture is getting drawn out of your plant. So, yeah, it's, it's a, in the wintertime, it's just kind of, you kind of have to really watch them. Well, you, Do they need more water? Do they need less? You talked about, you know, you can sunburn a plant indoors, but not all house plants require sunlight. What are some good options for house plants that are for house plants with uh, low light uh, needs? You know what? I was surprised when you, um, you know, I've seen pr- plants in offices. And my friend had a highlight plant in an office without any windows because she had those, you know, fluorescent lights on during the day because it's an office. But, you know, Spathophyllum lilies do well in lower light. Um, most of your ferns, um, a ZZ plant. I tell people you could practically grow that in a closet, but don't. <laughs> <laughs> if you're, if you're, you know, but it can take. It can, you know, when you say low light, pe- plants can can tolerate low light. Most plants would like a brighter light than you know low light. Right. But there are some that will tolerate it better. And I know people all stick snake plants in low light and that drives me crazy because really snake plants want to be in full sun and they bloom and they'll you know they expand and can break a pot they get so you know ex- so excited to be in a, a a pot and they're just spreading out and growing in bright light so i it's, a snake plant you know you can put it in low light but it's really it's just surviving and probably slowly dying um it's not thriving but a zizi plant unbelievable how low light it can take Calatheas take lower light. Um, now Gober- Gobertia, they changed the name. Or, yeah, Gobertia. Um, they can take pretty low light too. I have some in my bathroom, three feet from a window. Plus, they have a you know the porch is outside and there's and they got an east morning light. That's it, and they're doing great. That's, so there are light. There are plants out there well, that will take it. Absolutely, and that's that's uh, th- there's a lot of house plants as you know. So we really enjoyed having you in the program. 
Where can our listeners find out more about you and your houseplant knowledge? Um, you can find me on my website at the, the houseplantguru.com. And that, and your and book, you your book is there and, and available yeah, all, everywhere. All for, yep. All four of my books are available on my website. You know, I'll sign them and send them to you or, you know, any of your look, I like people just check their local bookstore first, support your local bookstore. And then if you can't find them, then go online. You can find them there too. Well, Lisa, we greatly appreciate the time you've offered Holly and myself and the knowledge about houseplants that uh, we have uh, obtained now that we didn't know before. Well, thank you so much for having me. It was It was wonderful. Thank you. A- absolutely. And when we come back, it'll be your garden questions, our garden answers. You're tuned in to the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. Have a garden question? Give Joey and Holly a call now or anytime 24-7. Just dial 1-800-927-SHOW. If you can't get through, leave a message and they will call you back. Call now, 1-800-927-SHOW. Tree Hugger Sprinklers are the ultimate watering device for either your newly planted or established trees and shrubs. Our sprinklers open and close around the trunk of your tree and provide 360 degrees of watering. With our adjustable valve, you can direct the water to your tree's targeted saturation zone. They come in three sizes, 7, 11, and 15 inches. You can purchase a tree hugger sprinkler at your local garden center, feed store, or hardware store. Go to treehuggersprinklers.com to find a retailer close to you. Or you can buy it directly from Amazon or treehuggersprinklers.com. If you're an independent nursery, garden center, hardware store, or feed store, you will want to stock this product. Contact the good people at Tree Hugger Sprinklers and they will get you set up. Your tree's best friend. TreeHuggerSprinklers.com Blue Ribbon Organics providing locally made organic compost and soil blends for gardeners, farms, landscaping, and more. To find our products nearest you, visit BlueRibbonOrganics.com. Chapin has the tools for planting your garden and keeping it growing all season long. Whether your garden is big or small, Chapin has sprayers and spreaders for fertilizing, weed, and pest control, watering, and seeding. You can find Chapin products at your local hardware store, big box retailer. You may visit them also online at ChapinMFG.com to learn more and buy online. You know what's different about Verlo Mattress? Everything. Like no price gouging, no shenanigans, none of the shady dealings of other mattress chains and furniture stores that overcharge for virtually the same mattress. The ripoff stops here. Verlo makes every mattress they sell, so you get better quality, lower prices, and a lifetime comfort guarantee. Because at the end of the day, you don't deserve shenanigans, you deserve a good night's sleep. Wake up, sleep better. Verlo. Happy Leaf LED grow lights are USA made in small batches for outstanding performance and long run cost effectiveness. Five year warranty and VIP customer service. Grow happy at happyleafled.com. Use coupon code Joey Holly to get 10% off any order over $90 at happyleafled.com. Head into Fleet Farm where you'll find everything you need. From tires to tree stands, drills to dog food, toys to tools, they've got it all. You can save even more at Fleet Farm when you join the Fleet Rewards loyalty program. You get exclusive offers and it's free to sign up. Get everything you need at a low fleet price. Shop in store or online today at Fleet Farm. The Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show is brought to you by the following. Happy Leaf LED, Root Maker, Jung Seeds, Tree Hugger Sprinklers, Verlo Mattresses, Farmer's Defense, Pomona Universal Pectin, Natural Green Products, Mantis Tillers, Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Welcome back to the Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show. Thank you for being with us today. Downloading the program, listening it live on the radio, wherever you are. Thank you for doing such. If you've got a question, it's time for a question and answer. If you've got a question, you can certainly submit that by GardenTalkRadio at gmail.com. Send us an email at GardenTalkRadio at gmail.com. Or you can give us a call at 1-800-927-SHOW. Toll free, coast to coast. It's 1-800-927-7469, Holly. All right, got a number of questions that come in. Let's see what we can get through to the top of the hour. This one is sponsored. The first question is sponsored by Fleet Farm and FleetFarm.com, Holly. Can you plant pumpkins and zucchini close to one another, or will they pollinate? Well, Joey. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, no. So. Y- yes or no? You got to uh, pick a side here. <laughs> 
uh, you know. You can plant them together. You can plant them together. So it, it depends on if you're the se- next generation of seeds. Right. If you're saving the seeds, no. If so they're not gonna they're not going to cross pollinate this season. Correct. Right, but next season you could get a zoo, a zoo pumpkin. Yeah, right. And yeah. we we've gotten a zoo spaghetti squash. We've gotten oh, them yeah. crossed before. Now it wasn't because we crossed them. They they came from the manufacturer. This was not Jung Seeds. This was a prior uh, company that we worked with. That the spaghetti squash had the tendencies of a pumpkin zucchini. And a squash. It didn't have the spaghetti strings like it normally would. It was more of a pumpkin, but it had a cross between a, a zucchini and a pumpkin, uh, as and it wasn't very good at all. There wasn't much you could do with it. Um, composting was pretty much uh, about the only thing that was viable option on that, as much as you may not want to. Well, Holly, we had an email come in at talk uh, garden talk radio at gmail dot com from Logan. What did he uh, wanted to ask? He says, hi, Joey and Holly. My name is Logan, and my wife and I love listening to your radio show. We started gardening here in Minneapolis five years ago, and every year we learn something new. We appreciate the content, and I was eager to learn more about enhancing our backyard garden. My question for today regards soil nutrition. We add fresh compost each year from the city's yard waste. We also started composting chicken manure from our backyard chicken's waste. It seems some plants do better with compost than others, not so much. What are some other ways we can keep our soil rich and help ensure other people plants, other plants produce a higher yield? Are there other plants that we might want to grow versus in compost versus chicken manure? Um, maybe only topsoil. Thanks for your answers and happy gardening. So they would be listening on AM 950 over there in the Twin Cities in Minneapolis. So thank you for listening, Logan. And uh, here we go. We're going to unpack this thing. So the city compost may be part of the issue. We talked about that in segment two where we're not certain what is being composted. So the result is not necessarily known and the toxicity that could potentially be in that could be affecting plants in your garden. Right. And so that you want to keep that in mind that you don't since you don't know the source of the city compost, that that could be a problem. So then as far as that, you might want to use some purchase compost, make your own compost, make sure you have a true organic compost. And so then to kind of help the soil that you have now, you would want to mix your organic compost with the aged chicken compost and you can just put it over the top of the soil beds as they are and then just let the elements do its thing right work it in the soil naturally through rain or watering now you can also go to mysoilsavvy.com and get a soil test kit it not necessarily is going to tell you if there is toxicity in the soil but it will give you an indication of what the ph level is if your ph level is dramatically off ph is a scale from 0 to 14 acidic to alkaline or alkaline to acidic which yeah acidic to alkaline huh seven is neutral most plants can grow without any issue between about six to seven and a half. If you're way off the scale one way or another, it is going to greatly change the way your plants grow. So by figuring out where you're at pH-wise level, they will also indicate, uh, inform you of how to alter or get things where they back need to be. If you get your pH where you need to be, assuming it is out of whack, that's going to take care of a lot of the issues because a plant is not going to grow very good if it's in very acidic soil or very alkaline soil if it's not nature's design to grow in those in those areas. Blueberries grow in a very acidic soil, like four. Um, you know, a, a, a alkaline soil plants. There's some plants that grow very good in the high numbers. You want about a seven if you're growing your tomatoes, your peppers, your eggplants, that type of thing. We get we get whack. Yeah. So you want to make sure that you have. Uh, an idea because just like you can't just look in the soil right, and go look at the soil. that's an 8.3 right and there are i don't know those that little um soil tester deal probe, probe thing. Yeah. and i don't know how accurate those it, are it will give you a range but not specifically i don't think it's 100 percent accurate it may be about 60 to 70 percent accurate but if we're uh if based on i think the ph may be off i think maybe there might be some issues with the city compost 
I think I think that's, I think it's I think it's a, a combination yeah. of things, and definitely good to to get a comprehensive test. Well, thank you, Logan, for writing in. If you want to write in just like Logan, you can do that at GardenTalkRadio at Gmail dot com. Send uh, your questions over. If it uh, needs to be added, a photograph to help identify what your problem is, that will be uh, appreciated on our end, and we'll get you an answer. Go ahead. How is the best way, I'll, I'll ask this for you, how is the best way to find how much compost I need for my raised bed? Is Certainly. there a formulation? So there's not, I mean, there's a formulation, but you don't have to do the math if you're like me and um, I moved on from math. Uh -huh. You can go to- Because the internet's on computers now? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you can go online and you can search for compost calculator and then you just fill in the information and it'll tell you how much you need. So we do suggest you order half a yard more than you need because you can always find a use for it, especially if you are right on the bubble and you could be like seven yards versus seven and a half or something like that. Go go big. Right. And when we filled our raised beds, we I think we ordered a, a yard more than what we needed and we put it on tarps in the garden in places where we weren't growing because we were in raised beds and we used that to top off the beds the next year and a half until we used it up so it was well worth the investment it didn't per you know it didn't work itself into the soil because we had tarps that protect prevented that from happening um so it was it worked fairly well all right uh we had a load of pine we have loads of pine straw and pine cones in our yard any reason i shouldn't use it as mulch no. So you can you can certainly use it. It will not make your soil acidic for some reason. There's this idea that using the because pine needles it's, are it's, it's not an ideal. It is a people think it's gospel. Yeah, like a I don't want a wives tale or something. Misinformation. Um, misinformation that people think it's acidic because pine needles are acidic, but the or pine trees are acidic, but you don't that's not going to transfer into your soil you can certainly use it for mulch it makes great mulch and also it's people say that it prevents um slugs and right, snails right. so pine needles on the tree yes they are about a three five on the acidic scale we talked about that in the previous uh, a question ago but as they fall to the ground they take a long time to break down into a compostable form and by the time they reach that compostable form, they have neutralized to about a 7 pH level. Now, if you're going to incorporate these into a compost pile, you would only want to use about 10% volume by uh, per pile, uh, so you're not over, because it takes so long to break down. Now, pine cones, on the other hand, we have used and have seen other people use them in their containers around the plants to keep cats or squirrels or other items from walking or digging in the bed. They'll get, you know, pine cones, when they open up, they're kind of prickly, and that can be a deterrent for rodents, in, in some rodents, cats and squirrels, uh, in, in most instances. Sometimes they'll kick them out of, the, out of the, the container, but that's an option as well. If that's not an option, just wing the pine cone at the squirrel or cat as it comes on your property. I know, squirrels are pretty crafty. They probably would find that pine cone and toss it back at you when you're not expecting yeah. it. All right. Uh, do pepper plants come back in the spring if left out? I, I, I didn't cut them down in the winter, and it's uh, still green inside. Will it produce peppers this year, or should I just remove it? Thanks. I'm in zone 5B. Okay, so in 5B, they will not come back. Come back. Some gardeners do overwinter peppers. We did try that once. I don't remember what happened. It didn't go well. It didn't go well. What we have understood is the hotter the pepper, for some reason, the more tendencies it is to overwinter. But essentially what you're doing in overwintering a pepper is you're digging it out of the ground or if it's in a container, you're going to take it into a root cellar or basement, and you're basically going to try to trick it into a dormancy state by limiting the water. There's a whole multitude of steps in order to kind of make it, you know, like a, like a tree. Loses its leaves, it looks like it's dead, but then in the spring it comes back. That is what we're trying to do with peppers. It doesn't work that well, at least what we've done and tried we find it just easier to start the pepper from seed the next spring. Now, the, the purpose of overwintering a pepper plant or an eggplant is so you can don't have to have that plant wait to grow 
to a fruiting stage. It can just come out of dormancy. You can harden it off again, and it can start putting leaves on and produce peppers essentially relatively rapid, much more rapidly than waiting most of the summer in order to get your first bell pepper or uh, hot pepper. So that that's something you can... Uh, you can look at in the more the pe- peppers are tropical plants and tomatoes are too. So in the tropical areas, you know, like Hawaii zone 11, zone 10, maybe eight, nine ish, you maybe could get away with having these peppers potentially over winter. I, I know that in some areas they, you can, you know, like wrap them or protect them. So you might be able to experiment in that, but farther North, not a chance, no matter what you do, uh, unless you try to bring them in and do that whole thing um, or put them under a grow light and try to keep them alive that way. So it's a it's a, a project in which you could do, but um, I don't, you know, it's, there's no there's no like quick and easy. I'm going to over four plus four is not four plus four is not always eight here. Right. Right. Exactly. Right. So with that being said, we are out of time and we thank you for yours. Miss any portion of the program today or would like to revisit it. You can certainly do that by going to our parent website, which is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener dot com and clicking on the season seven tab at the top of the page. Or we can send you an, and you can uh, catch past episodes there or we can send you an email. T- uh, we can, you can send us an email and we will send you a link to this program. Garden Talk Radio at Gmail dot com um and uh we can catch up catch you up there tune in next week to the program where we will be going over the topic of different gardening methods there's more than one and there's some that you didn't know existed as well as bad social media advice that we will correct our guest is new author ashila thompson will be with us and we'll answer your garden questions so until next week for hi baird i'm joy baird and we will see you in the garden.